Hello. Good evening, everyone. So this week we'll be changing uh, discussion topics. Since the past few weeks we were discussing topics from venereology, we had covered genital ulcer diseases this time, and we had a major focus on uh, different types of or different stages of syphilis and the diagnosis of syphilis. So I thought that since the uh, National Leprosy Day or the National Day for Neglected Tropical Diseases is approaching, it's on 30th January. So I thought this is a good time to shift our focus from venereology to leprology and this aspect is usually not, uh, I would not say neglected, but this aspect is usually not that studied with uh, as much gusto as it uh, should be. And since leprosy is a disease which is very complicated in the sense that uh, we are still not able to eradicate it even after such a robust WHO funded or NEC or uh, you know national policies have been made to control leprosy but still even after eliminating it in uh, more than like uh, nearly 20 years ago we have eliminated that but still we are not able to control the disease or eradicate the disease and still we keep on seeing patients suffering from Hansen's disease. So, uh, uh, I, would, I wanted to discuss this topic, the pathomechanism of nerve damage. The reason behind that is that it's somewhat of a topic which everybody knows a little bit about how the nerves are damaged in leprosy. But uh, we will go a little bit deeper. We'll find out the inflammatory uh, reasons, inflammatory cytokines and how are, what are the different mechanisms through which the nerve gets damaged in a patient of uh, leprosy. And that is the main objective of this uh, video lecture. We will discuss about the uh, various types of uh, damages that can occur to an axon. We will discuss how M. lepre is responsible for the attacking and destruction of Schwann cells, which are the which are an important uh, player in this whole mechanism of nerve damage. Okay, so slowly, slowly, we will start our discussion. And this is a very important topic, maybe not for clinical practice, but a very important topic academically because you frequently get. Uh, short notes on the, a short note on pathomechanism of nerve damage in leprosy. So we need to have a somewhat of a clear understanding as how does M. leprae leads to damage of nerve trunks in a patient of Hansen's disease. So without further discussion, let's start our discussion on pathomechanisms of nerve damage in leprosy. We know that leprosy is a disease of skin and nerves, okay? It starts affecting the two major organs that are affected, are skin and nerves. There is isolated nerve involvement in about 4 to 8 percent of cases. That means 4 to 8 percent of patients will have only nerve involvement. Clinically, we term those patients as pure neurotic Hansen's, but uh, most of the time the disease starts as a destruction to nerves and by the time there is severe neural impairment that the, that the patient complains of any nervous uh, derangement or nervous deformities, we usually have skin involvement. But isolated nerve involvement can be seen in 4 to 8 percent of patients. Now, acute, subacute, chronic immune mediated nerve damage can happen in lepra reactions. Now, in this slide, we'll discuss why it is important to study about nerve damages occurring in a patient of leprosy. We can have isolated nerve involvement. We can have further nerve damage during lepra reactions, both the type 1 or type 2. And it's better to use the term uh, reversal reaction or erythema nodosum leprosum. Also, nerve damage begins before the disease appears clinically. So it, it starts, the nerves start to get damaged from the earlier stages of diseases by the time the patient actually has any complaints so that they can come and see, seek treatment. The nerve damage can also continue after treatment. So even if the patient has received two-year course of MDT depending on the bacillary status, the nerve damage can also continue after proper treatment. So we need to be very uh, we, we we need to be very sure about uh, what the status of nerve damage that the patient is suffering from. Now, leprosy-induced nerve damage is the leading cause of all non-traumatic nerve damage worldwide. So it's one of the most uh, it's the leading cause of nerve damages, which is non-traumatic in nature worldwide. And we know that whenever there is nerve damage, there will be deformities. Okay. 
So they can be in the form of trophic ulcers, they can be in the form of blisters. If the motor trunk is damaged, it is uh, uh, it may be uh, it can lead to claw hand deformities, loss of livelihood to the patient, and these are permanent. This can be permanent deformities, and they are treatable deformities. So le leprosy induced nerve damage is the leading cause of all non-traumatic nerve damage worldwide. Clinically, detectable uh, neural involvement is seen in about 10% of PV patients and 40% and of multibacillary patients. What do you mean by that? We mean by that that 10% of possibacillary patients will have clinically detectable nerve involvement, while the nerve involvement increases substantially when the patient shifts from possibacillary status to a multibacillary status. Okay, let's move forward. So we'll revise very, very, very briefly how does leprosy actually starts to infect the body. So nasal mucosa has been said to be the site of initial infection. The myco, the mycobacterium leprae attaches itself to the nasal epithelium, and via nasal epithelium, it can go inside the lungs, infect the respiratory epithelium, and go inside the bloodstream. Okay. So from nasal mucosa, it goes inside the bloodstream and spreads around the body. And since it's more of an hematogenous spread. Is it is spread through the bloodstream? We have an asymmetrical disease. So you must have realized why, uh, why in tuberculoid pole you have this kind of asymmetrical involvement of cutaneous lesions. Why you may, why you don't see a proper localization of lesions uh, in the tuberculoid pole. While in lepromatous pole, the infection is so severe and widespread that you can have symmetrical diseases. But this is basically we are talking about as we move towards the tuberculoid pole. Okay, so in T.T. Hansen's, you will see an isolated, the, 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 the tubercle can form anywhere in the body asymmetrically. There is no particular predilection for that. So that is because the bacilli is spreading via the bloodstream. Now we know that the leprosy spectrum starts from subpolar TT to lepromatous leprosy, the tuberculoid leprosy to lepromatous leprosy, and it has been divided uh, uh, by ridley joplin classification into five stages or five types. So you have TT, then you have borderline TT, which is BT Hansen, then you have borderline borderline or borderline intermediate, then you have borderline lepromatous, and then you have lepromatous leprosy. Okay. It's easier to study leprosy in these five stages, okay? But it will be easier to understand leprosy if you know that this is a part of a larger spectrum. There are no clear-cut demarcation as such in between. There can be overlapping features and the, and the disease or the, uh, the immune response to the disease is gradual in nature. So that is why whenever we are talking about different types of the spectrum, the different uh, the classification on the basis of uh, of leprosy, we are talking about how a disease will shift more towards cell mediated immunity to humoral based immunity. So if in in TT leprosy you will have predominantly cell mediated immunity, and this cell mediated immunity will be able to kill the bacilli and restrict the infection. But as the patient moves from TT pole to LL pole, the immunity will shift to uh, humoral based immunity. That means antibodies mediated immunity. And remember, M. leprae is an intracellular bacilli. That means inside the macrophages, M. leprae is going to survive. And humoral immunity is not that good for killing intracellular bacilli. You require a robust immune reaction in the form of a cell mediated immunity. And when you have cell mediated immunity, you are able to restrict the disease and the patient will land up in tuberculoid pole. If it is humoral based immunity, you will not be able to restrict the disease and the patient will land up in LL pole. Okay. So as we move from TT to LL, we move from cell mediated immunity to humoral based immunity. Now, this, these are the two reactions, reversal reaction or the type 1 reaction and ENL or the type 2 reaction. So, reversal reaction, the patient will go backwards in reverse direction from lepromatous leprosy to TT leprosy while, he is, while they are receiving treatment. So, with treatment, if reactions occur, these are known as reversal reaction and that is because the bacilli are, are being killed and the fragments are getting attacked by the immunity. It's just an immune mediated reaction. While in ENL, erythema nodosum leprosum, the disease is getting severe, it's not getting treated and it is mainly because of immune complex deposition mediated damage. So, we clear about that. 
anywhere in the spectrum from TT to LL, reversal reaction and ENL, they can be severe, mild, moderate to severe, any kind of nerve damage can occur at any stage of leprosy. In the previous slide, we have discussed that nerves are the first organ to get involved and uh, they can and then and the damage can persist even after proper treatment of leprosy. We clear about that? Let's move forward. Now, these are the individual mechanisms of nerve damage or, or, or there are other uh, mechanisms of nerve damage which we will discuss here. But remember that if any kind of question comes in your exams that you have to write a note on mechanisms of nerve damage in leprosy, if you just remember these headings, you will be easily able to write pages and pages. Okay, You can write one page answer, you can write 20 page answer just by remembering these headings. That's why these are important. So that's how you should begin your answer. I answered like uh, like we are going to tackle is a just just think of it as a story. How does M. lepre enter the body, reaches the reach the nerve, attach itself to swan cells, uh, destroy swan cells, cause nerve damage? Okay, so so we'll go go in a story format and find out how, what what the, actually M. lepre is doing to the nerves. So first we'll discuss what are the features of nerve damage. Then we'll discuss the entry of M. lepre around the nerves, not the body, around the nerves. Infection of the Schwann cells, immunological mediated damage to the nerves, inflammatory cytokines involved, autoimmune mediated damage, the remaining mycobacterial antigens and some other mechanisms through which nerve damage can also occur. So let's, let's discuss each and every aspect individually. Okay, so we know that in, in leprosy, the peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is involved preferentially. The CNS is somewhat spared. Now, what do we mean by that? Initially, it was thought that CNS is not affected by leprosy. It is saved. But there have been studies which have shown that brain biopsy samples uh, have shown infiltration by leprosy or at least M. lepre fragments or bacilli. Okay. So, that means that the lepre, leprosy bacilli is able to invade invade that milieu of uh, neural involvement but preferentially the peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is attached and in that the peripheral nervous system is a major nervous system or the type of nervous system which gets damaged by leprosy. We know that the sensory damage occurs first. Okay, That is why in, in the grading of deformity you have the grade 1 deformity as sensory loss while the motor um, motor deformities are great too. So initially it starts as sensory derangement or deformities in the sensory peripheral neural system. Okay. And if this if the sensory uh, damage is severe enough, it can damage the adjacent motor trunk leading to collateral damage of motor neurons. Understand what I am saying. If the sensory nerve damage is getting more severe, it will also cause damages to the adjacent nerves and we know that nerves travel in bundles and because of that there will be damage to the adjacent motor nerve. Now, clinically, it presents as thickening at superficial sites. Now, what do we mean by that? So, whenever you are, you are looking for uh, nerve involvement, where, what are the sites that you usually check? You check around the elbows against the olecranon process or the uh, head of the radius. I'll be mistaken. But at the elbow, you see because the ulnar nerve is superficial at that side. Okay. And you you check behind the knee to look for the, uh, per, the uh, common peroneal nerve involvement. Because these are some superficial sites where the nerve is easily palpable. The thickening also occurs at those superficial sites. Okay. And that uh, the reason for that thickening is that nerves can get easily damaged while they're superficial. Okay, they are more prone to trauma. You, the as, since the nerves are not protected by anything at these superficial sites, they can easily be traumatized by other environmental insult. And because of that, a traumatic nerve or a nerve which is already damaged is easily infected by M. lepre, and the multiplication of M. lepre occurs more at that site, leading to proper thickening of nerves. Additionally, since they are far away from the internal body, the cold temperature of the body, these areas are colder and M. lepre requires a colder temperature to survive and multiply. Okay, That is why the peripheries are involved first. That is why the trunks at the periphery are involved. You don't see an involvement of uh, let's say a spinal cord or dorsal root ganglion at early stages of disease at least. 
you have more of a distal neural involvement you have a, you have a hypoesthesia at the hands and feet which we which we call it as glove and stocking hypoesthesia glove and stocking so in this picture that i've put here this is glove and stocking hypoesthesia here mostly seen where in lepromatous pole remember in tubercular pole you will more you will have more of uh, a symmetrical disease while in lepromatous pole it is more or less symmetrical with involvement more at the distal side as compared to proximal side so distal is involved more than proximal okay so these are some features of nerve damage let's move forward so i have told you that m lepre wants cold temperature so cold temperature are preferred that is why that is why distally it is much more the involvement is much more severe at the distal end round about 30% of nerve fiber have to be damaged for impairment that means whenever the damage starts it, roughly if it crosses more than 30% the patient will start to feel some complaints there will be symptoms now okay so 30% nerve damage should be there for impairment and in civil nerve biopsy we see perineural inflammatory infiltrate now remember whenever you go for a dermopath classes dermatology classes you will see that in biopsies from leprosy patients you will always see perineural infiltrate so infiltrate the inflammatory infiltrate will be seen around the nerves okay because the nerve involvement starts early non myelinated c fibers are involved early so there is preferential destruction of non myelinated c fibers first gradually gradually the destruction if not treated will involve the myelinated fibers also so all the a delta fibers all the every fiber can get infected the non myelinated c fibers are the first one to get involved okay the temperature loss or the uh, ability to distinguish between cold and hot temperature is lost first followed by light touch then followed by pain then followed by deep pressure so this is an important viva question and this uh, the loss of sensation this gradation of loss of sensation is often asked so temperature goes first then light touch then pain then deep pressure and with treatment the reverse order is there if there is any resolution that means the deep pressure sensation will come first pain will come first light touch will come and then and then temperature would come but remember there can be a permanent aspect of nerve damage all the sensations might not reach normalcy even with treatment it requires multimodal management uh, for hansen patient but this is the this is the uh, you could say direction in which in which sensation loss takes place temperature goes first then light touch then pain then deep pressure that is why it is necessary that if any hansen patient that you are examining you need to examine the loss of all sensation you have to do temperature sensation you have to do light touch pain deep pressure so in order to understand the pathomechanism of nerve damage we'll just revise what is the structure of a nerve is so here here is the spinal here is spinal cord this is the dorsal root ganglion and the nerve fibers emerge from the spinal columns they collect together and reorganize them at the dorsal root ganglion and then move forward in individual spinal nerve so this is a spinal now so i'm taking the example of spinal nerve but the cranial nerves are similar in structure the top most layer is known as epineurium remember epi theek hai epineurium then in between in between the epineurium and this bigger nerve bundle this nerve this whole nerve bundle let me see if i can change the color of my pen yeah this whole nerve bundle here this whole nerve bundle in between the epineurium and this nerve bundle you have the connective tissue this connective tissue will have adipose adipocytes fat cells blood vessels okay these all these cells now uh, this individual nerve bundle is lined by this membrane which is known as perineurium 
perineurium okay so epineurium outside then perineurium and inside this nerve bundle you have individual axons okay so this yellow one is axon which is the which is arising from the cell body of one of the one of the uh, neurons okay the pink one is the schwann cells which have wrapped around the axon we'll discuss schwann cells in much detail in the later part of the video don't worry individual axon and schwann cells are wrapped by a green membrane this olive green membrane that you can see that is known as endoneurium endo means inside so endoneurium epi means on top of so epineurium so we have epineurium perineurium endoneurium and gradually gradually the organism the m lepre will gradually infect and invade all of these layers to reach the schwann cells and axon and cause nerve damage okay and you can see that in this bundle a lot of axons are traveling some would be motor axons some would be sensory axons and if the inflammation causes significant damage to one of the axons the adjacent area can also get damage okay and these are the blood vessels okay these are the blood vessels and remember i told you in the first slide that the lepre bacilli is disseminated through blood stream so it is traveling through this blood and that is how it will go near the nerves okay let's move forward So the second feature is how does N lepre enter the nerves? So it enters through blood vessels and lymphatics at the epineurium. So we reminder this is epineurium. Okay. So it will enter through the blood vessels which are supplying the spinal nerve and the lymphatics which are supplying the spinal nerve. Okay. M lepre has multiple binding domains like mannose receptors, fibronectin binding protein, FC receptors. The most important molecule is lipoalbuminin. So if you remember our short our video on immunological aspects of leprosy, this is a very important antigen for M. lepre, and this is one of the most important binding site, or you could say the important molecule responsible for invasion of M. lepre. Okay. So what happens actually is in the blood vessel, M. lepre is traveling. It will attach itself to the the endothelium endothelium of the blood vessel. Let me just make a very short blood vessel here okay and we have the m lepre so here is the m lepre so m lepre will attach invade go through the blood vessel and reach a macrophage and when m lepre gets ingested by a macrophage it will keep on multiplying inside the macrophage like it does in the skin okay macrophage will kind of sequester or or hide the bacilli from the immunity why does why, uh, how and why does macrophage hides m lepre we have discussed that in detail in the uh, in our last previous video on leprosy immunological aspects of leprosy go back and see it you will be able to clear multiple concepts regarding this so the bacilli the m lepre is multiplying inside macrophages and if the, if the macrophage reaches the perineurium it will invade or these bacteria cells the m lepre cells will invade the perineurium and eventually reach the schwann cells and axons so the spread to the nerves is through the blood and through the blood then the connective tissue macrophages perineurium endoneurium then schwann cells and axons clear so there is invasion of the macrophages in the connective tissue we are clear about it that's how m lepre moves from the nasal mucosa to respiratory mucosa to blood vessels then to lymphatics then blood vessel lymphatics through perineurium then endoneurium and to the schwann cells and axons we are clear macrophages remaining the multiplying sites for m lepre The most important no, attachment molecule is laminin alpha 2. Now, laminin alpha 2 is an extracellular matrix protein on the basal lamina of Schwann cells. So, what happens is in the in the body, in the skin, you have macrophages. In macrophages, you have Schwann's uh, sorry, you have leprosy cell bacilli multiplying. But around the nerves, you have Schwann cells. So this is a Schwann cell which is wrapped around an axon. Okay. So it is wrapped around an axon. The Schwann cells serve the same purpose for M. lepre as the macrophages. So what happens is M. lepre is going to invade and multiply inside the Schwann cells. 
Now in the last slide, the M. leprae has reached the Schwann cells. Now we'll discuss how does M. leprae invade the Schwann cells. Okay, so these are Schwann cells. Keep this diagram in mind and we'll move forward. So the laminin alpha 2 domain which is present on Schwann cells is an important domain for attachment of lepra bacilli to the Schwann cells. Additionally, alpha beta dystroglycan complexes on Schwann cells surface they help in binding. So the M. lepra bacilli binds to the Schwann cells. Other adhesion molecules are like histone like protein HLP and ERB2 receptor tyrosine kinase signaling. Now just remember these words because these words you have to tell in your examination that the attachment of M. lepra to Schwann cells occurs through majorly by laminin alpha 2 dystroglycan complexes. So these two complexes are responsible for the attachment of M. lepra and will lead to M. lepra invasion inside the Schwann cells. So this is an important attachment molecule. Other molecules that help are HLP and also M. lepra induced signaling through ERBB2 receptor tyrosine kinase. Just remember these names. Remember that ERBB2 invasion leads to early demyelination. So let me clear all the confusion and listen carefully. When M. leprae has reached the Schwann cells, it will attach itself to Schwann cells. The attachment will take place using laminin alpha 2 and alpha beta dystroglycan complexes. Clear? Just remember these two words. Other molecules that will help are histone like protein. Also, PGL1 will also help. I will discuss in future slides. ERBB2 is also responsible for the invasion of M. leprae inside the Schwann cells. Just remember these three two words, laminin alpha 2 dystroglycan complexes, HLP and ERBB2. So let's move forward. I hope it is clear. If it's not, just write in the comments and I'll give a good explanation. So uh, now the M. leprae bacilli has reached the Schwann cells. So we'll discuss a bit, uh, very briefly we'll discuss what are Schwann cells. Schwann cells are also known as neurolemocytes. They are named after Theodore Schwann. They are glial cells that means responsible for the architecture and upkeep of the neural system. They are responsible for the myelinating and non-myelinating nerve fibers care. Okay. So what is myelinating and uh, non-myelinating? So in this diagram, this is a Schwann cell while this is an axon. Okay. Can you see how it has wrapped around the axon? So when they wrap around the axon, they also form, the Schwann cells also form molecules which are known as myelin. And because of this myelin formation, it forms a sheath around the axon which are known as myelin sheath. A good way to imagine this is, in kitchen you have that aluminium roll, in an aluminium foil roll. The axon is the cardboard core of the roll and the aluminium foil is the Schwann cell. So if you unpack the roll, if you unroll the whole aluminium roll, you will find that it is one single sheet, isn't it? One single sheet of aluminium. So what is what I'm trying to say is that the whole single sheet is like a Schwann cell. The cardboard core is the axon and the Schwann cells wrap around the axon in multiple layers. After wrapping in multiple layers, it will secrete myelin to form the myelin sheet. Okay, so they wrap around the axon and form the myelin sheet. They're responsible for nerve impulse conduction, nerve development, regeneration, trophic support. That means to give support of damage, uh, give support to da damage axons and show them on in which direction they should grow. Production of nerve extracellular matrix and modulation of neuromuscular synaptic activity. That means the exchange of signal molecules. And this is a very important function, antigen presentation to T cells. Remember I told you that they work similar to macrophages, similar to macrophages in the nervous system. That is one of the major function of a Schwann cell. They are responsible for antigen presentation to T cells. Schwann cells are the site for M. leprae invasion. So M. leprae is going to invade Schwann cells and in the uh, last video on immunology of leprosy, we have discussed how the M. leprae hijacks the macrophages and stays there and multiply. Same thing is going to happen to this Schwann cell. It's going to get infected by M. leprae and will lead to further multiplication and damage to Schwann cells. Eventually, this damage will lead to nerve damage. Let's move forward.
This is just a recap. This is the dendritic, uh, sorry, these are the cell body of the neuron. These are the dendrites. The longest dendrite is known as axon. Axon, and here you have the synapses. Okay. Now these are the individual Schwann cells, and you can see in this in this diagram that around the axon, one individual Schwann cell is wrapped. So this is one of the this is the cross section, and you can see that the cell, the Schwann cell, will eventually wrap around the axon in layers to form myelinated axon. So this is myelinated axons. Now the next question arises is. Does unmyelinated or non-myelinated axon have an attachment with Schwann cells? Yes, they do. But the Schwann cells does not, they do not form layers around it. Okay, in the next diagram, we'll see how do Schwann cells attach themselves to unmyelinated neurons. So here you have seen, here it is the immature Schwann cells and as they go, uh, go through the maturation process, if, it, if they are around a myelinating neural uh, tissue or the myelinating neuron, they will form this kind of concentric multiple layers around the axon. But if it is around non-myelinated, you, you can see one Schwann cell is engulfing. So here it is not wrapping, it is engulfing. While in myelinating, it is wrapping. Okay, so it's wrapping around here. It is only engulfing. So it just kind of like you put, um, uh, like in the revolver compartment of a pistol, you put bullets. So it looks like that. So, okay, so individual axons are engulfed by the Schwann cells inside, and that these are the non-myelinating Schwann cells. Okay, and these are responsible for repair and up keep of the axon. So whenever this axon is going to get damaged, here it's going to get damaged, the Schwann cells are responsible for repair of those axons. And this process keeps on going inside our body with continuous damage and repair. But when the Schwann cells are infected by M. leprae, if there are infection via M. leprae, this repair will not take place. Additionally, there will be further damage to the nerve. And because of that, the nerve bundles get damaged. So, uh, coming back to our story, M. leprae has now reached Schwann cells. It has attached itself to Schwann cells and then it will start to infect those Schwann cells. Okay. So, PGL1, which is an important molecule in context of leprosy, we have discussed that in detail in the previous video on immunology. And histone like protein on M. leprae interact with the surface markers of Schwann cells, which we have discussed in the previous slides. This interaction will activate phosphoinositol 3 kinase pathway. When PH3K pathway gets activated, it will lead to reorganization of actin cytoskeleton in Schwann cells. Let me put it simply M. leprae attaches itself to Schwann cells. PGL1 and histone like proteins on, so on M. leprae will interact with Schwann cells. They will activate phosphoinositol 3 kinase pathway. And because of activation of this pathway, there will be reorganization of actin cytoskeleton. Now, what is actin cytoskeleton? Every cell has multiple tubules, actins, microtubules, all the intermediate filaments. Okay, these are responsible for proper structure of the cell the way it holds its shape. If the actin cytoskeleton gets reorganized, it will lead to change of shape of cell. So the cell might change its shape like this. And what we are trying to make? We are trying to make a pseudopodia-like extension where it will engulf M. leprae. So what actually is happening here right now? The attachment of PGL1 and HLP to the Schwann cells is, is kind of stimulating the Schwann cells to engulf the M. leprae bacilli. And that is how M. leprae enters the Schwann cells. So this attachment, this attachment leads to phagocytosis or internalization of M. leprae and this is how a Schwann cell gets infected by the lepra bacilli. This biochemical interference of M. leprae 
with the host cell metabolism. What do we mean by that? Now, Schwann cells, a normal Schwann cell will keep on functioning for regular upkeep of the axons, but if it's infected by M. leprae, it is not able to do its normal function. So, normal function of neural repair, nerve regeneration, that doesn't happen. So, the, uh, the cell responsible for repairing nerve damage is not working properly. There can also be mechanical damage due to large influx of cells in fluid. So, whenever a cell is infected, let's say in this case, the Schwann cell is infected by M. leprae, it will, it will release some signals for the immune cells to come and help the Schwann cells, isn't it? All cells do that in our body. Whenever they get infected to release cytokines and chemokines, Schwann cells will do the same also. Other immune cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells, cytotoxic T cells, they will come and see what or what what is this commotion about? Why is Swan cells calling us? Okay, they will reach the area, and whenever there is a large influx of cells, large population of cells coming in the area uh, uh, inside a nerve bundle, which is a very packed bundle, because of this large influx of cells, there's mechanical damage to nerve tissue. So, there's another way that uh, this invasion of Schwann cells with M. leprae can cause problem for the nerve. So, one is interfering biochemically, second is mechanical damage. Third is immunological damage. That means the cytokines and chemokines which will be released by the immune cells and some of them are released by the Schwann cells will also damage. Remember, wherever inflammation is going on, it will also lead to damage of surrounding tissues. Okay, so that kind of collateral damage will happen. All the cytokines are responsible for damages. The aim of the body is to damage the infected cells and the bacilli, but some normal cells will get damaged. So, this immunological damage can lead to severe destruction of nerve tissue. When the damage is increased, it will lead to more collateral damage to the adjacent nerve. So, till here, the nerve which is infected by the, the nerve whose Schwann cells was infected by M. leprae, till here the nerve damage is going on. But if the damage is severe, it will infect or affect the adjacent nerve trunks also. In the fifth way is infected Schwann cells will release metalloproteinases which are responsible for destroying the connective tissue around the nerves and when the connective tissue which is kind of a protective barrier around the nerve gets destroyed the M. leprae easily invades and multiplies okay so remember the structure of spinal nerve you had epineurium adjacent connective tissue perineurium endoneurium if that gets damaged, it will be easier for M. leprae to come and infect the nerve, isn't it? So, that's what is happening here. Infected Schwann cells will release metalloproteinases and that is leading to destruction of connective tissue, leading to more invasion and damage. Okay, let's move forward. So, this picture is just to tell you what actually we have discussed in the past two or three, four slides that M. leprae bacilli, here is the M. leprae bacilli, will attach itself to the alpha and beta dystroglycan laminin receptors. So, here is the laminin. Here is the alpha laminin, which is the most important molecule uh, in the basal lamina of Schwann cells. Okay. So, Schwann cells is at the bottom and M. leprae is represented by this orange ellip elliptical picture, orange oval. So, remember, uh, so as you can see here, M. leprae is attaching itself to the alpha laminin alpha beta dystroglycan complex and this attachment is leading to phagocytosis of M. leprae and that is how M. leprae will get in, uh, engulfed by the Schwann cells. So, there is activation of the phosphoinositol 3 kinase pathway, re-enrichment of actin cytoskeleton. That is how Schwann cells will engulf the M. leprae. Now, immune mediated damage. So, we have discussed what all we have discussed now. How does M. leprae go to the nerves? How does M. leprae infect, attach itself to Schwann cells? How does M. leprae attach, uh, invades the Schwann cells? Now, M. leprae has reached the Schwann cells. In response, Schwann cells will release some chemicals, cytokines to call the immune system for help. Now we will study how these calling of the immune cells or the immune cells themselves will cause damage to the nerve tissue. We will start with CD4 positive T cells. So we have CD4 positive T cells which are predominant in the granuloma and also in reversal reaction. They are very cytotoxic to nerve cells. This is known as MHC class 1. Uh, 
Okay. This is known as MHC class 1 damage. Now, MHC class 1 damage, this is, uh, if you remember your immunology, most of the time CD4 positive T cells are associated with MHC class 2 presentation, but Schwann cells activate both MHC class 2 and MHC class 1. That is why there is a bombardment of CD4 positive and CD8 positive cells. Okay. So, CD4 positives are cytotoxic to nerve cells. They will come and destroy the nerve. Schwann cells will present M. leprae antigens to CD8 positive cells. Now, remember that Schwann cells are a type of antigen presenting cells. Okay. This is uh, somewhat of a similar function that dendritic cells have in the immune system. So, Schwann cells present antigens to CD8 positive cells and this will lead to Schwann cell damage. This has been seen in murine uh, pro, murine models, not in humans, but in mouse models, it is seen that the activation of CD8 cells by the antigen presentation of Schwann cells will lead to Schwann cell damage. And Schwann cells are very important cells of the nervous system. The MSC class 2 activation is enhanced by Schwann cells which are infected by M. leprae and MHC class 2 is responsible for secretion of cytokines like interferon gamma and also activation of T cell. This will lead to more chemotaxis and immune damage. Let me, sim let me simplify these statements. So here you have a Schwann cell. Here is a Schwann cell infected by M. leprae. The Schwann cell is going to call T cell. Both T cell 4 positive and CD8 positive. CD8 and CD4 positive will destroy the cell, destroy Schwann cell. So these T cells are going to destroy Schwann cell. Okay. The infected Schwann cell infected by the M. leprae will increase MHC class 2 presentation. MHC class 2 presentation. Let me just get rid of this. Yeah. So, MHC class 2 presentation will be increased and this MHC class 2 presentation is responsible for the secretion of interferon gamma and further T cell activation. When T cell activation will occur, it will lead to more T cells and the immune mediated damage will increase. Okay. So, infected Schwann cell will increase MHC2, MHC2 will increase T cell activation, activated T cells are going to kill Schwann cells. That is how Schwann cells are getting destroyed. It's a way of Schwann cells to destroy itself along with the M. leprae it has infected itself with. Okay. So, the, uh, remember how do, how do uh, other cells, T cells are responsible for destruction of cells which are infected. Let's say I am a cell and I have been infected by a virus or a bacteria which lives inside the cell. Leprae is an intracellular bacilli. How do I tell the T cells that uh, I have I've been infected? I will take some part of the bacilli and put it on the surface and allow the T cell to recognize. If T cell recognizes, it will destroy me along with the bacilli. That is what is happening here. Schwann cells is calling T cells to destroy themselves so that the M. leprae is also destroyed. Other inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma is responsible for secretion of important cytokines like TNF alpha. And TNF alpha is responsible for inflammation. Remember the video on psoriasis. TNF alpha, very important inflammatory mediator. And because of increased inflammation, there will be increased damage and collateral damage to the nerve. So, this is how immune mediated damage happens to the involved axon. There is also apoptosis going on. So, what do you mean by apoptosis? Apoptosis means cell. I should write apoptosis in red actually, isn't it? Apoptosis is cell death. Now, we will see how this apoptosis actually happens. Schwann cells present antigens to activated CD4 T cells. Activated CD4 T cells will release enzymes like granulysin, granzymes and perforins. This is the main mechanism of apoptosis in nerve cell. The release of granulysin and granzymes and perforins. Perforins is responsible for creating holes inside the cell, in the cell membrane. Perforate the cell membrane so that granulysin, sorry, granulysin and granzyme can enter the cell. 
and when these these molecules enter the cell they will destroy the cell leading to cell cell apoptosis okay this is the major mechanism main mechanism second mechanism is fast fast ligand related apoptotic pathway let's just say whenever fast fast ligand interaction happens it leads to the cell apoptosis we uh, in the future i have i've been getting request to cover immunity as well maybe when we'll uh, in the future when i'll have some time i'll discuss immunity in, in much detail it's one of the interesting aspects of medical science for me i love to read about immunity so let's uh, we'll discuss fast fast like an interaction maybe sometimes when we have time so fast fast like an interaction leads to apoptosis extracellular atp now remember atp is supposed to be inside the cell if ATP is getting outside the cell, that means cell is damaged already. ATP is producing mitochondria. If it is outside the cells, that means mitochondria is damaged. If mitochondria is damaged, cell is damaged, that means something is going on. So extracellular ATP is a marker of something is going wrong. Clear? So when extracellular ATP is, is seen in the circulation, this extracellular ATP will attach itself on the surface of target cells that i am not supposed to be here but since the cells are getting damaged it is releasing extracellular atp that means something is wrong with this cell immune cells please come and destroy this cell that is what's going to what is going to happen so extracellular atp is going to lead to apoptosis of the cell clear cell is not supposed to put atp on its surface it's supposed to contain the atp it's not able to contain because something is wrong. It's displaying ATP as a signal to T cells that come and destroy me. T cells will come and destroy them. Okay. PGL1, again, an important marker for leprosy, releases reactive nitrogen species, which are same as reactive oxygen species as far as function is concerned. We could say that they are analogous to reactive oxygen species. And like ROS, this reactive natural species will lead to further damage. So we have discussed, we have discussed four mechanisms of uh, damage. One is antigen presentation leading to granulysin, granzymes, and perforins. Second is fast, fast ligand interaction. Third is extracellular ATP. And fourth is PGL1, reactive oxygen nitrogen, sorry, reactive nitrogen species damage. So if you remember these four names, you can easily write immune mediated damage in M. leprae infection. Now collateral damage, we have discussed that whenever one nerve trunk is getting damaged a lot, it will lead to damage of the adjacent tissue. That will also happen. So mediators are TNF-alpha, remember, released by interferon gamma. Proteases, urokinases, these are all metalloproteases. Remember, infected swan cells will secrete those infected swan cells. So all of these are responsible for damaging the surrounding nerve tissue. The increased TNF alpha, which is produced by uh, by T cells in reversal reaction, also and also by infected Schwann cells, is responsible for increased inflammatory damage. Increased inflammatory damage. If you are if you are uh, following these videos for months, you will remember while we were discussing pathomechanism of psoriasis that uh, tnf alpha is responsible for the increase inflammation at the site of psoriasis the reason is that tnf alpha is one of the most important inflammatory molecule it is needed for that kind of inflammation similar thing is happening here the release tnf alpha is leading to increase inflammation at the site now when tnf alpha along with tgf beta can lead to significance Schwann cell damage. Now uh, we'll discuss TGF beta in one subsequent slide. Then I will discuss how TGF beta is leading to Schwann cell damage. Upregulation of cell addition molecules like ICAM1 on endothelial cells and HLA-DR in keratinocytes. Now, what are addition molecules? Addition molecules are somewhat. Uh, let me explain simply. Addition molecules are like parking lots. Okay, cars are like inflammatory cells. And the target cell where they are going is like a shopping mall. So you would like to go in a shopping mall if you have empty parking lots, you have empty addition molecules. Let's say you are, you are an owner of shopping mall and you want to increase the car traffic. You will buy some land and create a parking lot for them. That is what is happening here. 
the cell is increasing cell addition molecules that means opening up more free space more empty empty space where the cells can come and attach themselves where the cars can come and park where they can attach themselves when the cells attach they are able to carry their function so when cell addition molecules like ikm1 are increased we are just asking the, the inflammatory cells to attach their, uh, themselves on, on the cell and come inside okay that is what is happening so it's it's part and parcel of immunity and uh, immune mediated chemotaxis that i as an infected cell i would like to call immune cells so i will display a lot of additional molecules so they can come easily and attach themselves easily and do their immune mediated processes So this diagram is just a recap that dendritic cells, which are the antigen presenting cells, if they are able to kill the bacilli hiding inside the macrophages, they will lead to protective antimicrobacterial immunity. This is what usually happens in the tuberculoid pole of leprosy. Okay. The mediators are same, interferon uh, gamma and TNF alpha. Okay. Here the M leprosy is hiding inside the macrophages here. But if the similar thing happens to the Schwann cells, the Schwann cell will also get damaged. Let me write it again. Damage and the axon is also going to get damaged. And then it will be immune mediated Schwann cell destruction. So the same process which is destroying the macrophages and destroying M. leprae. If same thing happens to the Schwann cell, there will be destruction of nerves. Okay. And that is why you have neuropathies. Macrophages are free to travel. Schwann cells are attached to the nerves. That is why nerve damage is taking place. Okay, let's move forward. So this picture is just a recap of uh, the, uh, um, just a recap of the damages. M lepre on the bacilli. Sorry, M lepre bacilli macrophages organization I, I don't think so this picture would be important for you to understand the i will put the link the url for this article it's a very good article and you can see it in detail if i start explaining this picture it we will go in much much deeper the video will, will be unnecessarily longer than one so let's go forward interested students interested residents can still look up the whole article and read it's a very good article Complement system mediated damage. So complement system along with mycobacterial cell wall molecules, predominantly lipoalbuminin, can activate proteolytic cascade. Now, what is the function of complement system? Complement system is to complement the immune mediated processes. So immunity has a role. The role is to protect us from infections. Complement system help the immune cells to carry that role properly. That's what complement system is. Complementary, it complements the immune system. Okay. So the complement system, after activation by mycobacterial cell wall molecules, predominantly LAM, this is in short written as LAM, activates proteolytic cascade. Now this activation of proteolytic cascade will further lead to damage. If that damage occurs to macrophages, we are somewhat safe because macrophage is free, they are traveling. But if this damage occurs to Schwann cells, it will lead to nerve damage. Why? Because Schwann cells are connected to nerves, connected to axons. So damage to Schwann cells will lead to nerve damage. Additionally, membrane attack complexes. Remember, complement system makes uh, eventually forms a membrane attack complex which will attach itself to cell membrane and destroy this target cell. It, so complement system will lead to formation of membrane attack complex which will further lead to cell damage. Okay. Yeah, further lead to cell damage. Additionally, complement system co-stimulates T cell via C3D. C3D is a part of complement system. Maybe when we'll discuss immunity, I'll discuss complement system. It is one of the very, it's very interesting to understand complement system. So complement system leads to proteolysis. Complement system leads to membrane attack complex. Complement system leads to co-stimulation of T cells via C3D. Three mechanisms by which complement system can help 
और इंक्रीज द डैमेज टू श्वान सेल्स सो वी हैव डिस्कस ग्रेजुअली हाउ डज एम लेप्रे इन्फेक्ट नर्व देन इन्फेक्ट श्वान सेल्स गो इन साइड श्वान सेल्स लीड टू इन्फ्लेमेटरी डैमेज इन्फ्लेमेटरी मीडिएटर्स दो मीडिएटर्स आर कॉलिंग द इन्फ्लेमेटरी सेल्स लाइक टी सेल्स दो टी सेल्स आर डैमेजिंग दी श्वान सेल्स एंड नर्व ओके क्लियर टिल दैट सॉरी वे क्लियर क्लियर टिल नाउ Now previously, along with TNF alpha, we discussed TGF beta, transforming growth factor beta. TGF beta is responsible for immunosuppression. Let's say TGF beta is like brake and TNF alpha is like an accelerator for immunity. So TGF beta is supposed to suppress the immunity. In TGF, in leprosy, TGF beta levels are raised. So what happens is TGF beta is going to suppress the immunity. okay raised levels of tgf beta will suppress the immunity and when immunity is suppressed the bacteria will keep on dividing and multiply so that is what is happening m lepre after infecting the schwann cells is hijacking the use of tgf beta in order to suppress inflammation so that they are not able they able to kill the m lepre and m lepre divides unhindered now the question would arise why the increase of tgf beta is not limiting the inflammation which is happening why is it only uh, allowing m lepre to spread why is it not decreasing the inflammatory damage the reason is that tgf beta is not the only break there are other breaks there are other accelerators apart from tnf alpha so immune mediated damage is a very complex process tgf beta is just one of the major immunosuppressive molecules okay in other words m lepre is hijacking schwann cells to number 1 call a lot of immune cells around the nerve number 2 release a lot of inflammatory cytokines to destroy the nerve number 3 release tgf beta so that M lepre itself is safe from the immune mediated damage. So you could say like that. M lepre is kind of calling the other uh, side to dam to shoot himself while wearing a bulletproof jacket. It's an easy uh, easy analogy to understand that I myself have 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 a whole armor on and I'm just calling the other side to shoot no matter what and it's leading to damage around me, but I am safe. Okay. TGF beta leads to down regulation of TNF alpha and interferon gamma leading to unhindered bacterial multiplication autoimmune mediated damage now it is not proven as of now but it was postulated that because of nerve damages a lot of molecules are being released inside the circulation and these molecules can uh, these molecules can lead to autoimmunity okay like uh, autoimmunity normally occurs through an auto antigen so it was postulated that myelin fragments released during nerve damage can act as auto antigens but they have not been proven despite that demyelinating antibodies can be seen in about 20% of serum samples in some of the uh, studies but still now this kind of autoimmune mediated damage has found to be non contributory to the process or disease monitoring so just we are just here to mention that myelin fragments were sometimes uh, were initially postulated to be an auto antigen but they have not been proven to be there there have been other auto antigens also but none of them have shown promise in the fact that you cannot use them for uh, disease process or disease monitoring so there is no point in going forward with autoimmune mediated damage microbacterial antigens now similar to autoimmune antigens it was postulated that the destroyed bacilli the fragments of the destroyed m lepre bacilli can act as antigen further increasing the inflammatory damage okay why do we so why do we uh, thought that that sorry why do we think that uh, because nerve damage has been shown to continue after treatment so whenever you have whenever you encounter a hansen patient a leprosy patient you have started treatment after 2 years of treatment the nerve damage can still occur don't we say that neuritis and reversal reactions can still occur uh, or, or lepra reactions can still occur after 2 uh, to 3 years of uh, stopping treatment that happens isn't it now if you have killed all the bacilli with treatment why do we still have this kind of reaction because the nerve damage is continuing after treatment so it was postulated that the damaged bacilli 
can release fragments which can act as antigens and immunity is trying to destroy those antigens further increasing inflammatory damage. So damage M. leprae fragments can act as antigens leading to ongoing damage. That is why even after treatment you can have nerve damage. So these damaged fragments can have cell mediated hypersensitivity and the immune system can damage it. Additionally, these fragments can interfere with nerve regeneration enzymes. So the nerve which is already damaged. Now the nerve has been damaged by M. leprae. M. leprae has been killed by treatment. Now damaged nerve remains. That will take some time to heal. Now this nerve regeneration is not able to properly happen because of this. Because of the remnant fragments of M. leprae. Okay. But this is not the major mechanism. It's one of the minor mechanisms of nerve damage. Okay. Now, additional mechanism, this is just for extra knowledge, extra theory. If you write that in exam, maybe it will fetch you more marks or in viva it might fetch you more. But these are some additional mechanisms of nerve damage. For example, you can have neurotrophins. Neurotrophins are responsible for nerve growth and regeneration and their expressions are decreased in leprosy. And because of decreased expression, normal nerve growth and regeneration doesn't happen. So, there is prolonged uh, nerve damage. Neurofilaments. So, neurofilaments, like any cell filaments, uh, are present inside uh, around the axons, sorry, not around, inside the axons, and they are responsible for axonal growth and nerve repair. There are three types low weight, mid, mid weight, or medium weight, and high weight. By weight, we mean molecular weight, okay? There, the phosphorylation of these filaments are, are needed for axonal growth and nerve repair. In leprosy, this phosphorylation doesn't happen properly and you see hypophosphorylation in leprosy. That means the phosphorylation is decreased in leprosy. Phosphorylation decreases in leprosy. That is why damaged nerve are not able to repair properly. The third addition is notch pathway. That is a query. That means studies are still going on. Uh, uh, the activation of notch pathway has been found uh, in patients with lepra uh, reactions, lepra patients with nerve damages. So it has been postulated that notch pathway can be may be responsible for for nerve damage. So in this diagram, we are seeing the same thing that M. leprae attaches itself to ERBB2 receptor. Remember, this receptor is responsible for early demyelination remember okay now when it attaches itself to the receptor this activation of map kinase map kinase will activate and increase cyclin d1 this through the num gene will activate notch signaling notch signaling will lead to overexpression of uh, gene response elements like hes15 and hey1 and these response elements are responsible for demyelination that is how the act the action of m leprae leads to demyelination okay this is, that, that is just you know i'm just uh, skimming through these additional mechanisms because you must focus on the initial in, immune mediated damage to nerve tissue okay so just to recap very quickly m leprae will infect and uh, infect nose go to respiratory mucosa, go inside blood, travel in blood. Through blood and lymphatics, reach perineurium, invade, sorry, reach epineurium, invade the nerve, invade macrophages inside the connective tissue, invade uh, perineurium. Through invasion of perineurium, there will be invasion of endoneurium, will infect the Schwann cells by attaching itself to Schwann cells using the laminin alpha dystroglycan complexes. After attaching, it will invade inside using PGL1 mediated phagocytosis. It will go inside, it will, uh, in the infective Schwann cells will release inflammatory molecules calling T cells to itself. These inflammatory molecules may include uh, extracellular ATPs, all the MHC class 2 expressions, MHC class 1 expressions. The infective Schwann cells will release metalloproteinases, which will destroy the surrounding structures, leading to a better invasion by M. leprae bacilli. Okay, when T cells will come there, they will release cytokines like TNF alpha, interferon gamma, TGF beta. TNF alpha will lead to a lot of inflammation. There will be inflammatory damage to nerves. TGF beta will lead to uh, immunosuppression, which will allow M. leprae to multiply. Uh, unstoppable, the M. leprae will be unstoppable, it, they will, it will multiply a lot. 
okay interferon gamma is going to increase more dnf alpha and the cycle will continue if the nerve damage is severe enough it will cause damage to adjacent nerve that is why it starts as sensory nerve damage and gradually prolongs and prolonged infection reaches motor nerve damage okay with that being said i'll finish this video on pathomechanism of nerve damage i know it's a detailed video but everything you need to know about nerve damage in leprosy is covered in this video just go through it just remember the headings and you will easily able to memorize or even understand how does m leprosy destroying nerves okay and on the occasion of national leprosy day i'll just write here national leprosy day that's on 30th jan even i am confused i remember it it could be 30th jan or it could be last sunday of jan okay most of the time it is celebrated on 30th jan but if some some of you have heard about it being on last sunday of jan let me know in the comment section let us resolve if it is last sunday of jan or 30th jan 2024 okay now these two videos have already been made months ago while we were discussing leprosy these were the only videos yet before the current video that we had made on leprosy and they they uh, they go very very deep inside the manipulation of immune system by the m lepre bacilli what what does our immune system do to m lepre and what does m lepre do to our immune system so these two videos cover both of these aspects i have tried to condense at least 10 15 articles in each of the videos and it will be it will help you to understand better about immunology of leprosy it's a very important topic academically go through these videos if you want search them in the playlist i will also put the link in the description and uh, will uh, it will help you to better understand this uh, disease known as leprosy these are some reading recommendations uh, they uh, these uh, this article and this article is very good if you want to know about physiology and pathophysiology of nerve damage otherwise you need not go through the individual articles this video is more than enough uh, if interested students interested residents can go look at the full text of this article read these are very good articles so that being said we finish our video on pathomechanism of nerve damage it's a very important topic academically short notes are asked viva questions are asked and uh, one needs to know what is happening so that they are able to search if you see one lesion of leprosy on the back doesn't mean that you are not going to palpate behind the knee you have to palpate nerve involvement occurs prior to skin involvement you need to examine all the peripheral nerves and you'll be able to better classify give better treatment however the current treatment is the three drug regimen for 6 months for uh, posi bacillary and three drug regimen for uh, one year for multi bacillary we extended to two years but i have a feeling that in the coming years i think every leprosy patient is going to get three drug regimen for at least a year for posi bacillary and more for multi bacillary these are just my personal feelings no uh no i have not read articles uh, advocating the use of a longer regimen so with that let's finish this i hope you uh, enjoy your weekend any comments suggestions can be uh, any ways to improve this presentation any new topics you want to be covered any doubts any information that you would like to contribute in the discussion just put it in the comment section till then adios bye bye and enjoy your weekend bye